first years side by side. They watched each other's children grow, then graduate high school and college. They celebrated the first grandchild on the scene. They talked every day, two, three, four times all day about nothing and about everything, whatever was on their mind. <laughs> Thank you. And my last one is uh, called Cannonballs. It is inspired by Jacob Lawrence's painting, Victory and Defeat, panel 13. I counted them all. 22 black cannonballs tell the story about the American struggle. They look like the heads of my enslaved African ancestors on their way to the Americas in a ship packed so tight that surely death would be better. Moving across the Atlantic, hoping to survive another tossing of the waves and that smell. What is that smell? Cannonballs as instruments of bloodshed and war. I see 22 polished black women concubines used to grow the deep south like cannons birthing black babies one after another. So there can be victory. Industry abounding, buying and selling black men, black women, black children, industry abounding. There are 22 cannonballs that remind me of 22 black women marching for women's suffrage, still walking in the back, still. Cannonballs like black lives on the ground, covered up by agendas and smoke and mirrors and deals that happen on phone and never on paper. Monopolies and defense contracts and let's go to war. Cannonballs resulting in settlement and agreement. Everybody giving up something. Mutually winning when losing and losing when winning. Shaking hands and tasting sweet victory. Reconciling our real cost and living with the lingering bitter aftertaste of defeat. Jacob Lawrence would say that the exchange is superficial and the sword is real. The colors are true, the angles are sharp, and the lines are without fault. Cannonballs representing a means to an end, used to push over and move over and through obstacles, used as weapons to force victory. It is the polished black cannonballs that remind me of our American struggle. 22 black lives reloaded into generational canons, 22 means to an end. Thank you. Thank you, Noni, for unmasking and sharing some of what you have written in our anthology. Our next reader will be Tracy Harold. Thank you. I am honored to be here today. And what I'm going to share is some quick highlights from an essay that I included in Black Writers Unmasked, and it's called Transformational Inclusive Leadership with Mind, Heart, and Soul. And let me just share, this is a real life story based on thousands of voices in business. And this is a solution to a common problem that we've been trying to address for decades. Transformational Inclusive Leadership with Mind, Heart, and Soul. And this is part of my bigger than me success series. And I'll start with our shared problem. The ideals of racial justice, equity and inclusion that have fueled protests in the streets of America and around the world should also be fueling conversations about inclusion, mental health and safety inside the workplace. The purpose of this essay is to add a new level of urgency to our actions by spotlighting solutions for experiences that can be harmful and traumatic, which continue to happen as an embedded part of the business world. Things like unconscious bias, similarity bias, unequal performance standards, and a lack of leadership accountability. Now this has been my life's work. And although most companies offer some type of diversity training to define some of these topics, Many are not focusing on the full problem and they're unsuccessful in addressing the real impact of these challenges on real people in the workplace. But the good news is there are solutions to these challenges. From the boardroom to the mailroom, from Microsoft to McDonald's, from nonprofits to academics, from corporate culture to the corner store, all 
organizations share a critical compound problem. We must address the urgent need to number one, prioritize the importance of inclusion for all at a systemic level. Number two, acknowledge the variable or different experiences that some employees often have in business. And number three, simultaneously and intentionally focus on new strategies, new experiences, and new approaches to co-create new desired outcomes in the area of diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and belonging. Now, I started leading a strategic initiative within corporate America called the Adaptive Leadership Equity and Inclusion Initiative. And that originated from a humble notion and a burning desire to create inclusion, equity, justice, and safety, both immediately and for generations to come. That then became formalized into a Bigger Than Me success series by bringing together hundreds of DNI experts, community leaders, inclusion champions, engaged allies, impacted individuals, woke executives, and various individuals and industries around the world. We created a movement. And our call to action is transformational inclusive leadership. It's really about inviting you to embrace a new level of urgency and ownership when considering how you approach DNI, diversity and inclusion. Many magazines share that the business case for diversity is a failed strategy. The good news is, as Brene Brown says, stories that we own, we get to write the ending. And stories that we don't own, own us. There's even more good news. We have real answers. And it's not the only way, but what I'm excited is there are roadmaps, there are blueprints. This concept, transformational inclusive leadership, builds upon proven research and relevant studies, industry best practices, ageless wisdom, strategic programming, training, consulting, et cetera. Years, thousands of years of real world experience and leaders who share lessons learned. What I'm excited is, is that participants of this program have shared that they thought they had their things figured out, but guess what? We don't. There's a lot more work to do and I'm excited about what the future holds. Transformational inclusive leadership with, with mind, heart, and soul offers practical solutions and includes an iterative activation and implementation lifecycle with seven proven phases. Now is the time for us to rebuild trust, rethink training, and address trauma together. Thank you. Thank you. Alan? Thank you, Tracy for unmasking and sharing some of what you've written in our, in our anthology. Our next reader will be Gail Haynes. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I am coming to you with a fiction story and it, um, it is regarding pride and how sometimes we need to come down from off our high horse and face ourselves in the reality of it, that we are all just people and no one's better than anyone else. So the name of my story is not actually a poem, it's called Coming to Jesus Out of the Ditch. You all ready? This was her day to rise up into her authentic self, she had so much pain, disappointment, and shame. She heard God's voice call out to her, come to me, my daughter, so I can restore you from the damage and the pain you have suffered. As she walked, she stumbled, and the heel of her designer shoe broke off. But God positioned the angels on both sides to catch her as she fell. As she emerged out of the ditch from where she had been, she felt the warmness of God's love shine on her tear-stained face. By this time, her mascara had smeared and her $3,000 weave was coming loose. 
Her story began less than one year when a man swept her off of her feet. This man was not only drop dead gorgeous, but very rich. She fell hard for him like white on rice. She was so sure this was the man that was for God given, a God given gift for her. She trusted and gave her heart wholeheartedly. She didn't realize she was slowly descending into a ditch of passion, lust, and deceptive love that could not satisfy. You see, she was looking for love in all the wrong places. While standing at the wedding altar, she looked around at all her friends, smiling faces and clapping and screaming, telling, go, congratulations, girl. You done made it, you done made it. She assumed she was the envy of women everywhere. She licked her red lips and she flipped back her hair. Her long diamond studded eyelashes just fluttered as she looked deeply into his eyes and said, I do. While holding his hand, she whispered, I'm so blessed God gave you to be my man. As he smiled and lightly kissed her cheek, she glanced around just to see if anyone saw that kiss. He replied, I do, and whispered, thank you, baby. I'm blessed to have you too. Just like Eve, who listened to the serpent and ate the fruit, she too was unknowingly deceived. It was a long before she was crying on her knees, God help me please. For that same smiling faces that said, congratulations girl, were as the same ones who shamed her with disgusted looks on their faces saying, girl, you knew he wasn't no good. You are a disgrace. For only 10 months later, this gorgeous, rich husband, ran off with another woman, a love story gone sour real fast. One teardrop of grace and mercy came from the Lord who she had just rejected in the beginning. When he said to her, this is not the man that I sent you, my daughter. She didn't listen for she believed all she needed was this man in her life, no one else, not even God. As she cried out, God's unconditional love broke the soul tie that connected her to this man. She soon began to be free to crawl, climb, and walk out of the ditch of deception to victory. Wasted and stained was her beautiful white designer wedding dress. Her beautiful $3,000 weave was now a hot mess. The lonely diamond ring set on her finger, her bouquet of flowers wilted and dying as she thought of her husband's cheating and lying. Lord, forgive me for leaving you. I now know you are the only one who really loved me. As she came out of the ditch, her footing became sure. She got cleaned and washed her through and through, gave her a new purpose, and, and uh, no purpose and life filled with joy. She thought maybe I needed to go into the, into the ditch to realize that God's love is all I needed and to get rid of all this pride. Um, experience and struggle can sometimes be the best teacher. As she rose into her authentic self, all the pride, the glitz and glamour were all gone for good. She humbly walked with purpose, glad to be free, loving herself with all the victory. She laid her pawn that diamond ring, you all, and her wedding dress at the high-end consignment shop and gave the money to her single parent sister who she just looked down on, you know and who she had not spoken to for many years because of her prideful uppity attitude. 
And that is the end. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Gail, for sharing yeah. some of what you've written in our anthology. You're and, welcome. Uh, Thank you very much. I will share uh, a few things myself. And then, um, and the first will be a letter from the past, Klan race riots. There was no warning that they were coming. Millions of stars filled the night sky, not a cloud in sight. Nothing prepared us for their coming. In the dead of the night, their, vo their violence exploded. Our lives were the target of their destruction. Each way we turned, they defeated us. They burned our homes, they killed our babies, though we struggled to save them. What could we do when there was no one willing to help us? When the carnage was over, they left the dead behind. Among the horrors reminding us of their coming was a torn white sheep hanging from the branch of a tree where death had taken its bounty too late. Rape was my bond long before I was born. My black body stretched, pulled, and destroyed till it was bored. Ghosts haunt me now. Shadows lay at my feet. From between my muddy legs, the babies came, all colors, shapes, and sizes, screaming and dying as they bled in the land by the slave master's hands. Like the bars on the body of old Job, I learned to separate the pains of my flesh from that of my soul. God poured into me a supernatural endurance. As I said to myself, the slave master's vain lust is my insurance. I couldn't stop the sting of his whip on my hips. He couldn't stop the utterance of my lips. It's my mind you can't rape. It's my soul you can't take. I wept when they called it rape for me. 400 years too late, daybreak. In the dark of the night, we wait for daybreak. With the coming of daybreak, we will see our lives come together or become unglued. Either way, the change will come at daybreak. Go back to Africa. Go back to Africa, the white man screamed in my face as if to say, this country belongs only to his race. I would go back, I said to him, if I could only go alone but I must take you with me. What do you mean take me with you? He asked. I'm already living in my country. All your genes and your DNA must come along with me as well as your white skin, you know. And what might I ask does that mean? He asked. You cannot imagine how devastated it was for some of us when we discovered we were not white, but black. Our DNA from the man who caused our conception, even our skin color indicated that we were white, while the genes of our mother said we were not. Yes, I would love to go back to the motherland, but I'm afraid you would have to come alone. All those genes of yours you have given to us from the pleasures you enjoyed from using our black female bodies from century back must come along as well and spill their deeds upon that land, which most likely will send us all to hell. My last piece will be from my the last book of my trilogy, Miss Anna, the Promise Keeper. You know, my love, it just kills me the way you're always talking about how the past will be buried and forgotten. Let's live in the present, right? After dressing raspy and a rush about getting ready for work, Raymond followed her with raspy in his arm. It would help matters a lot, Anna. Let the dumb niggas Forget the past while the white racist bastards build armies to annihilate us, I suppose. What damn armies are you speaking of, he asked, taking a seat on the bed while Raspy bounced up and down on his lap. What the hell do you call the Ku Klux Klansmen if they don't stem from the past? Anna insisted the smell of the burning cross Kenneth Mike had thrown in the stall where she worked still stinging her nostrils. When the Black Panther sprang up across the country, the white power structures shot them down like dogs in the street. But you know what they say when you tell them the Klan is still up in the hills building armies? Oh my God, where is this coming from? White men say that they know nothing of it and those with the guts enough to admit it is true says there is nothing they can do to stop it when, the, when all the time they know it's their racist behavior they are protecting. That's bullshit, something created by your mother's sick mind. It's bullshit, all right, she said and walked back into her bedroom. I love her. I swear I love her, Anna said aloud to herself. 
You love her, but you would love her more if the man who fathered her had been a black man. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I will now turn the evening on to my co-facilitator, Minnie Collins, who will introduce the next readers. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Tonight, this evening, and in our anthology, you can read about hope, love, wisdom, proverbs, but these are just today. Historically, African Americans have been singing through spirituals, gospel, blues, folk tales, and sermons. All of the information we have centered around wearing a mask in order to survive. Continuing with some of the same or completely different thoughts, I'd like to introduce Dr. Georgia McDade. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I have three poems. The first one is The Greens, and I admit it's one of my favorites. New growth green, old growth green, fern, oak, spruce, elm, alder, pine, Crayola can't touch this. The next one I call two for one. And I wrote this one after I saw a collage by Elizabeth Halfacre. Two toothbrushes, two deodorants, two beds, two alarm clocks, two VCRs, two Thanksgivings. She would have gladly relinquished one half her belongings. She would have settled for their loving each other one half as much as each loved her. She would have gladly given up dad's one house and mom's one house. All she ever wanted was two parents in one house, a house neither mom's house nor dad's house, but rather our house. And finally, I call this one the cranes. The cranes are coming, the cranes are coming. For three years, Seattle has been the crane capital of the United States. Why be surprised the cranes are coming to your neighborhood? Surely you didn't think the cranes would stop downtown. The cranes dig deep, the cranes dig wide. The cranes never build only. The cranes always destroy first. No more peat patch, no more red apple. Where is Mr. James Washington's sculpture? Of course, people will marvel at the new creations, but at least for a while, some of us will cringe at the coming of the cranes and the destruction they bring. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKay. And coming up, reading next, Rolé Morsi, or he likes maybe for us to call him Ison. Is that acceptable, Ison? That works well. Thank you. And we say good evening to Town Hall. We're glad to be here, but we're very excited to be a part of Black Writers Unmasked, in which we have four pieces, two short stories and one and two uh, poems. I'm going to try in my time frame to do one of each. The first being Thanksgiving with no turkey. Thanksgiving with no turkey is about a miracle and an act of greatness served with generosity. It's about a grace continuation of life and the beginning of a great friendship. It's about how God weaves our cloak of life that we are so warmly wrapped in. Imagine you're traveling to a distant place to be with family and friends for Thanksgiving Day. Envision your excitement when you are heading a family delegation to join the larger family celebration from your part of the land. Just think when you are stopped in your tracks with an incomparable act giving you a prophetic message, an event of such magnitude that you were given a message to tell people about it, a message that has great hope, joy, loveliness, 
and truly holy mysticism that is clothed in undeniable spirituality. Now think about that some of all of those of you who love coming and taking control and driving in your car at over 70 miles an hour, see yourself coming to a dead stop upside down after multiple rollovers in a car accident. Imagine you can even see and feel loved ones as they and you look over at the edge of light as wings of angels pad your multi-force rollover accident within a divine cushion to a sliding stop. This image became an instantaneous reality for us as we experienced such a frightening car accident on our Southern California trip. Us is a blended traveling family of two bands with me. Isom, the 60 plus senior, my daughter Zena, and her two month old son Jazir, plus two nephews, Imani and Paul, and my niece Geneva, who was driving in an addition to my nephew Thomas, who was driving his van with his family, and Rachel, daughters Reese and Mally, and my daughter's significant other, Adriel. We were all amazingly blessed and no one was seriously hurt, not even two-month-old Jazir. We were enveloped in a divine cocoon and shielded with grace as there's no other reason we should have been alive except God. Even Jazir only woke up when his mother touched him on the cheek as she sat on the ceiling, which was now the floor of the car after the rollover. It was only then that Jazir began to cry. Our family was transported by the California Highway Patrol, loved and known as the CHP, to the nearby Denny's in Willows, California, where staff were waiting for our arrival. I know that there had to be some earlier communications from the CHP as the Denny's and their staff had a table set up for our entire family. They had all the custom, they and all of the customers were quite kind and sensitive to my traumatized family. Many of the fine folks at Denny's began to offer comforting words and I felt good and safe. I thought of the great change in the country for our traveling black families as I was reminded of my dad and past drives down south when I was growing up. We were always told to wait in the car until he checked on the stop to see if it had changed. Willows had definitely changed, Daddy. Some of the folks at Denny's even expressed offers of help, such as advice on sites and local places, and were willing to drive us to get a rental car if we might find one. In passing by Willows many times before, on drives to Southern California, a person of my persuasion might easily picture the small city of Willows as a town down south that you wouldn't want to stop at. You wouldn't really expect help. And yet here my family was in the Valley of Kindness. We were really welcome in that Denny in Willows, California by all that was there. But sitting in that Denny's really set in as we were now facing the dilemma join our family for the annual greatest meal. Because of Thanksgiving, there were initial reports that no rentals were available for a 200 mile area around Sacramento. My brother Curtis sent word that we would be put on a waiting list and were also calling insurance companies as had totaled the van. 
It was a tense period for all of us. And we were calling insurance companies and calling to the North and to the South. Through this trauma, meals were coming and extra kindness were built in as they were delivered by the staff. Then God made a way as clear as possible with angels on earth. Jenny and Bob Barnes became God's two who stepped in as angels and said, take our keys and continue on your way to the celebration with your family in the South. Just bring back the van and drop it off at Willows and Diddy on your way back. It's got about 85,000 miles on it, but it will take you there. And, and it is what would be strongly expressed. This was strongly expressed by Jenny. Here's how all of this really happened, as it was important to understand that Jenny was becoming interesting and interested in our whole affair. It seems as if that Denny's was hers personally, and her own investigation was pursued. She came up to me when we first got there, and I was having everyone stand to offer a prayer. She asked me, what are you going to do now? At a time and in a manner that really caught my attention, I told her that we were first going to say a prayer of Thanksgiving. She faded away for a minute. We had phone calls still going to the insurance companies to rental cars as well as relatives to the north and south. Then again came Jenny when I noticed was coming her when I noticed her coming out the corner of my eye, I thought to the Lord for patience as she was inquired to me again, well, where are you going? What are you going to do? I gathered my diplomacy and shared with her that I was going to Southern California to join our grand family for the Thanksgiving holiday weekend, and we would be returning to Seattle. Miss Jenny faded in the recesses of Denny's, and we continued our amazing visit at that Willow's Denny's. As I was standing for some reason at our table, again I saw Miss Jenny approaching me this time with a man whom I knew to be her husband, Bob, soon. It is then that Miss Jenny walked up to me, gently took my hand, placed the keys in her, from her van in my palm. And she said, take our van, go to Southern California, enjoy the time with your family for Thanksgiving, and return the van and drop it off at Willow Stinney. I was blown away. I looked at my nephew, Thomas, across the table from me, and then again at the couple. Bob really reassured me that it was okay. We were then introduced, and I readily followed them to their van to see it. As I walked out, my sister-in-law called me and told me that there was no car all around. I told her I begged to differ. To differ. She said, huh. I said, I'm here now with the woman that I'm going to have her van and I have to go. She said, huh, again. I told her I had to hang up. Our family delegation did make it to Southern California. We did return safely. We all enjoyed a wonderful time during our time there. Dinner was served to all Disneyland visits and other visits. Then we drove back. We returned in a blessed moment and met again with Jenny and Bob. My brother drove from Seattle with his son-in-law to meet us. And we had additional vans, returned their van, and we continued on to South. Uh, we continued on our ride to our final destination in Seattle. I would also like to share that since that time, which has been about nine years ago, uh, Miss Jenny has passed away from the face of the earth, and I still consider her 
one of the angels in my life. The second is a short poem, Concrete Roses. Piercing asphalt and raising the indomitable human spirit in us from a cultural seed, we strive for what we came for, knowing where we came from. Will you yearn for what we want? Please see the creator. Is it the spirit in us? We are spirits encased in earthen vessels. We join earth from falling precipitation of the universe. The stardust sprinkled into each of us with an ember of eternity given by the creator for us to breathe up on this earth. It is this galaxy dust and breath of God we are. We are all. We are what we are and grow as concrete roses, splitting asphalt furrows. It is like a footpath to a garden, piercing the essence of the car on asphalt road. Our growth goes on to bear the weight of the tires and the feet of the people while remaining as a stub of grass in the middle of the street. We claw at life and are fine in every pause of the beat of our heart. We are our own cinder blocks stacked up on each other to the height of eternity, bringing the road up to a pathway in the sky. And between us is the mortar of love that continues to take us on high. And all we do, we create an arc with many keystones, each having its own thought, each having its own emanation, each having its own brilliance and its own creation. Our roots reach down to concrete, weaving between rocks as branches that shadow glass ceiling into the shape of hope. Our leaves unfold unto views never before beheld as they are our own creation. Even the granite pillars, pillars cannot stop our growth for on top of each is a capstone of new hope. Our fragrance mix, mix with industrial smoke and waste. Our nostrils fend off the stench that was passed through each day as arms touch everything in every way. Weeds grow despite all that fall down the hill below and seek to contaminate the very rows that our feet are entrenched in. We cast off the pheromones of magnetic culture, which attracts even though they seek to detract. We are not but concrete roses growing in asphalt and enduring our buds unto unappreciative society. Yet we grow. We grow and grow as a tree spawns of new stores in the mind that are yet unborn. We are concrete roses. Thank you. Thank you, Isa. Beautiful. I love those nature concepts. Unfolding more creative writing. Our next reader is Lola E. Peters. Thank you, Lola. Thank you, Minnie. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, <clears throat> The African American Writers Alliance has been the key and the heart of my ability to write and publish. And I am so grateful for this uh, latest um, anthology and being included in it. Thank you. So the first poem is called Spring Blossoms. Recognize the fallow time when nothing happens above ground, as earth feeds seeds in darkness and earthworms turn detritus from the active seasons into mulch and peat and dirt. Does the seed despair of the blackness that surrounds it? Does it fear transformations happening within? Is it aware there is possibility in its future? Can it tell what it will become? Then comes that violent moment, the seed bursts and life surges upward against gravity, forces its way toward the sun, pushes the darkness out of its way, losing part of its protective coating. 
unsure what the consequences will be, aware it can no longer stay confined in comfort, proclaims itself a new thing upon the earth. We smile at the crocus or the daffodil, not comprehending the revolution behind its birth, dangerously diminishing sorry, dangerously diminishing the potential of our own insurgency. The next poem is, um, is called um, Dark Matter. We are the black firmament of all beginnings, birthing stars and moons, planets and comets, we are the force holding celestial reality in suspension with imagination, sparking life from the collision of aspiration and determination. We are the force focusing thought into action, squeezing reality out of dream time, revealing life disguised as endings, carving paths through shifting sands of memory. We are the force between letters and words, notes and melodies, numbers and formulas, quarks and beings. We are the force coaxing seeds beyond their shells, singing buds into blossoms, dancing fields into universes of life, feeding the planet. We are the unseen, the unacknowledged force holding meaning in place, birthing reality from fantasy. We are the force, nurturing nations' souls with music, dance, art, theater, nourishing the world with kernels carried from ancestral memory. We are the dark matter binding time to space, defining the existence of all things, animating the inanimate, our extinction, signals the unraveling of universes seen and unseen. We are the force. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lola. Wow. I'm still a part of your seed and the force. And I love the repetitiveness of we are the force. And all of us as writers, facilitators, emerging and published, we are the forces that maintain the balance of life. Thanks to all of the readers, writers, participants today, those who are visiting online, and now back to my co-facilitator, Helen Collier. And I also wanna thank all our readers. Everything was so beautiful mm -hmm. and our guests. We as Black Americans stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. We honor them for their resilience to survive their harsh and cruel environment. As Black writers, we are here this evening because they survived to take us to a higher level. Their lives through our writing shall never be forgotten. Because April is National Poetry Month, I will end our reading this evening with Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poem, We Wear the Mask. We wear the mask that grins Brands and lies. It hides our cheek and shade our eyes. The debt we pay to human guile, with torn and bloody hearts we smile. And mouth with merit subtleties, why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured soul arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is bowed beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world think otherwise. We wear the mask. Thank you all this evening. Are there any questions in the chat that needs addressing? There's one question, Miss Helen, and it is, any suggestions for young black writers wanting to publish? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that uh, they should seek a publisher if they want to publish. And we do have a publisher uh, in our African-American writers uh, 
organization. And um, so that is a start. Published and first, you got to write something to be published. Once it's, you write something to be published, then it has to be edited. And then uh, a publisher has to uh, be assigned to it who sees that the potential. So yes, that is uh, uh, something that can occur for you. Join our, our organization and, and, and surely it should happen. And if yeah. I may, yeah. uh, look, if you're local in Seattle, uh, hopefully you are a reader of the South Seattle Emerald. But the South Seattle Emerald is always encouraging young writers to publish. And so if you have a poem or a short story, uh, or if you want to become a journalist, it's a wonderful organization to connect with. Um, if you go to their website, which is um, southseattleemerald.com, uh, uh, or is it .org? Never remember. Anyway, go check out their um, uh, work with us page and it'll give you information on how to submit your work. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's an organization that exists but, but, uh, particularly for um, publishing um, the work of uh, BIPOC uh, people. So, and we love youth voices. I think I think I'd like to add so yes and for those two answers I'd also like to add options that exist for young writers and old writers alike there are amazing self-publishing options online as well so uh, as as was mentioned by Helen write 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 you got to have something to write so write regularly connect with groups like AWA and also again there are easy relatively easy self-publishing options online as well. I see Noni's hand. I was just going to add that there we have many authors, like Miss Minnie mentioned, we are published in Emerging Writers, and many of our authors are only published in the anthologies. And so join us, join the writing group, um, and um, find your voice in your writing, and also an opportunity to see your writing in print, and uh, see, uh, explore that in, as well as uh, the many different genres. So we don't have an age limit or an age restriction for AWA. So you're welcome to join all ages. Thank you. If there are no other questions, we the African American Writers Alliance, thank you for joining us. Have a blessed rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much to our writers for joining us this evening. And thank you to our town hall audience at home. It was so lovely to get to hear all of your pieces tonight and to hear a little bit about publishing. It's great to, to understand more about that in the area. So to pick up your copy of uh, this book, you can go through the African American Writers Alliance via the link that we've posted in the chat. And once again, on behalf of town hall, thank you all for being here and have a great night. Thank you, Adele. Man Town Hall. Thank you Thank again. You. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Good night. <laughs>